Welcome back, fellow soldiers, to the third and I promise final episode on the hot topics hot topic. of capital punishment. If you stuck with me this long, perhaps you'll stick out a little bit longer as we once and for all put that final nail in the coffin of our examination of the death penalty. I'm Pastor Shane, and I'll be the undertaker of undertaking this task as we appropriate some culture. <laughs> So to start today, we're going to review and readdress some of the common arguments against the death penalty and tackle some new ones while we're at it. We started with the premise that the death penalty cannot be intrinsically or inherently wrong due to the fact that God, who is perfectly good, instituted the death penalty. And not only institutes it, but also seems to justify it in Genesis 9-6. In fact, reading through the totality of scripture, you'll either see examples of capital punishment or straight up affirmation of it, but nowhere will you see condemnation. The closest example of condemnation would be the section of John dealing with the adulterous woman, which I went on a rant about last episode. If you want me to ruin one of the most favorite Bible verses, uh, go check out that video. But some may offer other scriptural suggestions to refute the use of capital punishment. For instance, Romans. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Now, some may take this and say, See, it is God's to avenge, we're not to take revenge, and capital punishment is an exercise in revenge. But that seems to be a bit of a stretch. If this is a supposed argument against capital punishment, uh, then it's also an argument against punishment, full stop. Because you could just as easily say, we have no right to incarcerate people because incarceration is a punishment and an exercise in revenge, and God alone is to avenge. Well, he, he doesn't say, don't take harsh revenge, or don't take serious revenge, or don't take fatal revenge. He says, don't take revenge. The severity or gravity or degree of the revenge is not the issue. So if we're to be against capital punishment on these grounds, then we should also be against all punishment, like Seattle or Portland. Secondly, Paul is not addressing the state, he's addressing individuals. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. We know for certain that he's not talking about the state or the governing authorities, and he's not suggesting that the government doesn't have the right to carry out retributive justice. We know that for certain because in this very letter, in the very next chapter, he explicitly says that they do. Here's that passage again. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Everyone acknowledges there's a difference in authority between individuals and the state. If I lock someone away in a cell for the rest of their life, that would be a crime. If the government does it, that's just prison. And Christians are not called to mob justice or vigilantism. We're not to be Batman. And really, the silliest part of the modern renditions of Batman is that he doesn't kill. Because that's really the only way to be an effective vigilante. Because nothing he does would ever be admissible in court. He wouldn't put anyone away. It's an automatic mistrial. That's a layup for the mobster's lawyers. And that's not even including the fact that the entire Gotham justice system is totally corrupt, which is the entire reason we need Batman in the first place. It, it, no, we don't have time for a rant. The point is, the Bible is also pretty consistent on this. God in the Old Testament sets up cities of refuge to prevent people from taking justice into their own hands and to ensure that there's a fair trial. What's more, the Romans passage I don't think is even dealing with law-breaking. There are plenty of evil and wicked things that are not unlawful, and plenty of ways you can be wronged that isn't against the law. And in those instances, 
Don't repay evil with evil and don't be overcome by evil. Next argument brought to us by Sean Penn in Dead Man Walking. I just want to say, I think killing is wrong, no matter who does it, whether it's me or y'all or your government. This is a sort of variation of the argument we looked at last week, that the death penalty does not respect the right to life. And it's not particularly persuasive. He says, killing is wrong if it's me, you, or the government. Uh, that's a moral argument. He's using moral language. It's wrong. But we know that not all killing is wrong or moral because God, who gives us our transcendent source for our morality, commanded it and decreed it. And everybody knows that not all killing is the same. There's a difference between murder and killing. Murder is the premeditated killing of an innocent person. The people we execute are not innocent. Their heinous actions have rendered their lives forfeit. Well, let's put it this way. Most people, I think, would agree that if someone were coming at you, trying to kill you or seriously harm you, that you have the legal and moral right to use lethal force to prevent that. It is morally permissible because their heinous act of trying to kill you has rendered their life forfeit. But if it's morally justifiable to kill for the lesser crime of attempted murder, then why wouldn't it be morally justifiable to kill for the greater crime of actual murder? Their heinous act has morally forfeited their life. Now you might say, well, one is in the heat of the moment. True, but I don't see how that actually changes the moral equation. And if you think it does, you're really going to have to show your work because God throughout scripture seems to disagree. What's more, the forfeiture of your life is also the moral justification for killing in war. There's a societal compact that if I'm participating in this act of war, that my life is therefore fair game. That act has forfeited my right to life. That's the entire reason why we make a distinction between the military and civilians and why killing civilians is wrong. Now, if you're a pacifist and you think all killing is wrong, whether it be capital punishment or self-defense or war, okay, I don't agree, but at least that's consistent. Next argument, capital punishment is too expensive. That's not a moral argument, that's a pragmatic one. And it certainly is true that death sentences are more expensive, in part for good reason. Uh, there's more appeals and legal procedures and hoops to jump through that make it more expensive. Uh, but it's a non sequitur to say that capital punishment is expensive, therefore abolish it. Uh, how about we just make it cheaper? And to those ends, appropriate in the culture is brought to us by the firing squad. Cheap, efficient, and if done right, Painless. Got your hands full with murdering, raping terrorists? Well, just give them a cigarette, slap on a blindfold, and let us do the rest. The Firing Squad. Alrighty, so opposition to abolishing the death penalty is not opposition to reforming capital punishment. There are ways it could be cheaper, there are ways it could be more efficient, and there are ways it could work better. The fact that people sit on death row for decades, that people die of natural causes before their sentences can even be carried out, that's less than optimal. In fact, that really goes back to the argument about deterrence, that the death penalty is not an effective means of deterrence. Part of the reason that might be true is because the consequences of the action need to be close in proximity in order to effectively deter. If I said to my kid, you're grounded, and then 40 years later, I eventually follow through with it, that's not going to be particularly good at curbing behavior. So yes, there are many ways in which we can improve our justice system, including how we utilize the death penalty. But the question was, does its use in our culture for heinous crimes produce a more just and righteous society or not? So far, I think we've seen that it does. But let's hear the next argument. The death penalty does not allow the guilty person to repent. Huh? I don't even understand this one. Now, I'm getting this from uh, Father Nakombo Frederick. Let's hear him flesh this out a little bit more. He says, the death penalty is irreversible. It interrupts any process of healing, of reinsertion into society. It constitutes an admission of failure by society to show solidarity with those on its extreme margins. Killing a human being means eliminating him, not punishing him. Okay, so first of all, not all justice is about rehabilitation. Hell would be a perfect example. Hell is punishment, not rehabilitation. Does that mean that God failed? No. 
And our society doesn't fail either when it punishes, even if it doesn't rehabilitate. And you'll notice again that the abolition of the death penalty inevitably devalues human life. That's what I just said, right? Interrupts the healing process of reinsertion into society. That's not even life in prison with no chance of parole. So what's a human life worth? We're talking about heinous crimes here, people who have murdered multiple people. What's a human life worth? 50 years? 20? If it's all about healing, then isn't the sentence squarely in the hands of the perpetrator? You know, yeah, I, I, I murdered and I raped multiple people, and I'm, and I'm sorry about that. I'm very sorry about that. But you know, I, I, I've been doing a lot of work in here, doing a lot of healing with the man in the mirror. And I gotta say, I'm a lot better now. So I think I should be reinserted into society. How about no? And the notion that the death penalty doesn't allow people to repent is simply untrue. Back to Sean Penn. Mr. Delcourt, I don't want to leave this world with any hate in my heart. Or I ask your forgiveness for what I've done. It was a terrible thing I've done, taking your son away from you. <laughs> How about us? Mr. and Mrs. Percy, I hope my death gives you some relief. So, he repented. People on death row are, are really more likely to repent because they know exactly when they're going to die. That is a way of focusing the mind on our sin, on the things that we've done, and the state of our soul and the eternal condition of it when we die. Plenty of people have come to Jesus on death row, and no matter their heinous acts, Jesus is sufficient and Jesus is capable to forgive them of it. That's the true rehabilitation. Death row is as good a chance of repentance as you can get. You know, it's far better when, than when death comes like a thief in the night. You know, you can die suddenly of a brain aneurysm or a car accident and never once come to terms with your sin or actually contemplate the reality of heaven and hell. The biblical reality is that we are all on death row. We're all sinners, as the scripture says. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We're all going to taste death as a consequence of sin, as a consequence of wrongdoing. But through faith in Christ, we can have new life. And that's true as well for those who are sentenced to death in our own justice system. All right, we did it. Well, if you, if you like what we're doing here, like, subscribe, and tell a friend about it on the usual social media platforms. You can follow me there. And I'll see you next week to appropriate some more culture. Mm -hmm.